record now. So we've got a document for those who are unable to come. All right, so I hope you guys had a fruitful conversation um, and I look forward to hearing uh, about what went on there. So does anyone um, want to start us off maybe from room one? Um, so that was Jack, Donnie, James, and Joshua. Uh, what did you guys talk about? Yeah, we kind of didn't venture past the like the first few pages where he's just uh, talking how how man, I guess, um, Jack might be able to help me here, but like we're basically how they form philosophies or how they bring, like have a feeling and the feelings leads to thoughts or ideas and the concepts and the concepts they, you know, have intuitions about things and the intuitions. And so just like the process of how do we come to theories or come to know something. So pretty much like the fundamentals of how we philosophize, uh, like just, our experiences and how do we bring these experiences into context to have conversations and like he just kind of starts there then he goes into like the uniqueness of genius and like pretty much how genius is to do something that's kind of different than like um, the you know the rules of art and to kind of be in that way or something so just you know is we could break it paragraph by paragraph and kind of extract things but it's, they're very simple, but very like, uh, they take a lot of engagement to kind of uh, tease these things out, so. So which, which question in particular were you guys occupying yourselves with? Uh, the, the paper, the reflection, yeah. Yeah, so the genius, this sort of mysterious figure <laughs> um, as the source of production of beautiful forms is behind those questions. Um, but did you guys, so what specifically about aesthetical ideas did you guys come to clarify? Um, did that kind of language enter your conversation at all? So uh, I provide okay. an example, which we can jump to later on at the end of the, um, the slideshow, at the end of the reading guide. Um, but yeah, what do you guys think about that? So what is an aesthetical idea versus, it might be helpful to contrast it as Kant does with a rational idea. Did anyone come up with maybe an example to distinguish those things? Because art's supposed to deal with and provide um, sensuous modes of access to these aesthetical ideas. Um, and that's the role of the genius and facilit facilitating that sort of a possible experience. But what exactly is an aesthetical idea? Is an aesthetical idea like the, um, he says like representation of the imagination that's not intelligible by language. So is it that part of like observing something without judgment is like your aesthetical idea? Well, there is judgment when it comes to aesthetical ideas, but it's what Kant refers to as reflective judgment as opposed to say a cognitive judgment. So when I look out the window, I might say, um, oh, there's a dogwood tree sitting outside my window. Which of those two kinds of judgments would that be an example of? A cognitive judgment or an aesthetic judgment? That, or a, I should say reflective judgment. A cognitive judgment. Right. And so that kind of judgment is what is generative and communicative of knowledge, right? So if I say there is a dogwood tree outside my window, I'm making a description of empirical reality, which is available for anyone else. And I'm using two elements, uh, a concept of tree, and then more particularly, more specifically, dogwood tree that I have available to me. And then I'm using the sensory intuition, the intuitional manifold of some visual appearance that seems to come to me from outside. And I am applying the concept to it to render it intelligible. And I'm in that effort stating a fact. And as a fact, it's presently available and communicable for all of you. Um, 
And when I do that, I'll, I can just say, okay, yeah, there's a dogwood tree outside my window. And in that expression, I know that there is some object near me and I know exactly how it's near me. So there's a window separating us and I know what it is. And at that point I'm done. I don't really need to say anything else. I understand what's going on. <laughs> and because I understand what's going on I can translate it and communicate it and express it and so forth. Uh, but if I say now, oh, that tree is beautiful. Uh, it's really beautiful. Um, that's a, a reflective judgment, and it points back to my subjectivity, the peculiarity of my experience leading to, in this instance, a kind of pleasure. So I look at this entity, which I'm able to label dogwood tree, and in my visual engagement with it, I experience some kind of pleasure, um, some kind of satisfaction. Um, now, compare that, <laughs> the experience of the tree's beauty to the satisfaction that might be remarked in my cognitive judgment and the expression of it. So if I'm looking out the window and I don't know what it is, so if there's some obscurity, if it's like really dark or if there's a rainstorm or something or my eyesight is poor and I can't exactly see, I'll feel um, dissatisfaction because I wanna know, I want to know what's going on. But then when conditions change, they improve, I'm able to recognize the tree as a dogwood tree. I now have experienced some sort of satisfaction. So I say, oh, I know what that is. And I'm done with it, I can move on. But when it comes to the other sort of judgment, the reflective judgment in which I recognize not the descriptive presence of this thing I call a tree, but my own subjective experience as in the grip of beauty in the face of this tree, as it shows itself to me, um, there's something about that satisfaction, which I express in the word beautiful, that isn't um, in any conclusive uh, final sense wrapped up for me, right? And that's why I can, if I have the time and energy and uh, general motivation, I can sit here and just look at the beautiful tree for as long as I desire. And so long as I continue to look at the beautiful object, I will experience the subjective event of participating in beauty. Um, Is there a reason that women are more keen to that overall, it seems? Like, uh, I know, like my wife, she's always like, oh, it's so pretty flowers. Woo like everything's like, so it's green, it's lush. Look at the sky, the moon. It, it, it might be because women in our society and perhaps in most societies are just sort of taught that that's okay for them to express. Hmm. Yeah, so I mean, remember Kant is trying to identify something about the phenomenon of beauty, which is sufficient to bring together and bring out into stark intelligible relief our shared humanity. And so that would be understandable independent of um, like gender or biological sex determinations. Although I should also point out that Kant, um, an unfortunate product of you know, the 18th century was deeply, profoundly, disturbingly sexist in a variety of ways. Um, and along those lines, if we're comparing say the aesthetic phenomenon of beauty to that of sublime or sublimity, he characterizes the sort of uh, feminine persona as more uh, beautiful Whereas uh, there's something about sublimity that's supposed to be deeply masculine and heroic and so forth. So there are these gender distinctions still in Kant, but that doesn't mean um, that men are incapable of recognizing beauty or appreciating beauty and so forth. Um, ultimately any less than, than our women, at least from um, Kant's theoretical point of view. Um, but so, um, this is, is a weird example. So I'm talking about a tree. Here's a weird example that's um, on the one hand, not exactly accurate in terms of Kant's technical vocabulary. So this is an example of what he would strictly speaking refer to as pleasant or charming and not beautiful. But who in here enjoys avocados? Okay, so I, I really love avocados um, and there's something really unique, really 
aesthetically singular about all the various perceptible aspects and dimensions that constitute the object that we call avocado. So strange that um, if I asked you to be able to, or to try to explain to someone who has never eaten of a, an avocado, maybe even never seen an avocado, has no idea what they are, and you're trying to describe for them what it's like to eat one, <laughs> um, how difficult would that be? My analogy is, imagine a mango that's a vegetable. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I've heard comparisons to like a banana texturally. Uh, but if you tell someone, oh, it's kind of like eating a banana, and then you give them an avocado and they take a bite out of it, they'll probably be upset with you. Because um, <laughs> there are many differences in the experience of these foods. Uh, but there's something about avocado that's so strange because of the texture, the flavor, and so forth. Um, and the enjoyment of it is so singular that words language fail us, right? Yet, in any case, we have recourse to the concept avocado. Uh, but the concept is not adequate. It's not sufficient to make sense of the sort of enjoyment that I derive from the subjective experience of eating the food, right? So there's something about the aesthetic, sensuous experience of even an, eating an avocado that language, insofar as language is grounded importantly in concepts, fails to um, enliven or to satisfy or make sense of. Uh, and so that's kind of where, what he's getting at when it comes to aesthetic, I, aesthetical ideas versus rational ideas. So when I look at the tree, there is something in the presence, in my subjective opening up, which yields this moment of pleasure and happiness in my perceiving the tree that exceeds the bounds of the conceptual limits by which I am able to um, render intelligible what the phenomenon is. Um, and so artists play with that, right? Using the imagination. So they play with that in various um, sensuous representations, whether imagistic, pictorial, auditory, uh, and so forth. Um, they try to play with that in such a way that like with the tree, if you're dealing with a, a work of art that you understand to be or recognize as beautiful, you can return to it over and over again. However um, satisfied you might be with respect to the theoretical language and conceptual apparatus that you have at your disposal to make sense of the work of art or to describe it or to um, communicate uh, its aspects and how you experience it to others, right? And then the counterpart to that would be a rational um, idea versus an aesthetical idea. And um, we can talk about that a little bit later when we get the time, but hopefully that makes some sense just to kind of help you as you're um, thinking through that prompt for the reflection paper. Um, okay, how about those of you from room two? So Eva, Justin, Ryan, and Tristan, what did you guys talk about? Um, uh, I know one of the things that we talked about, we talked mainly about um, for the like, discussion forum, the first prompt and the third prompt. And we kind of discussed how there are a lot of things I feel like that we normally wouldn't have like really given a second look at is beautiful that we may be doing now while we're in isolation, you know? And we talked a lot about um, hobbies as well and like art forms in that sense, being able to like, it's really picked up during the pandemic and isolation as we're kind of stuck alone to ourselves. Mm -hmm. And we don't have much to do other than maybe through some of these creative outlets. And so we kind of talked about that for the first prompt and then for the, we just barely touched into the third one, just kind of like pondering over like the idea of this innate sense of knowing what's beautiful and what's not. And kind of, we directed it more towards 
nature and like natural things in the sense of like a flower is beautiful but you know like this little rock or pebble on the ground might not be as beautiful and kind of I don't know yeah just really dipped our toes in just kind of thinking how interesting that idea was. Yeah so this is touching on the census communis idea that we all seem to know and share more or less wide agreement as to what counts as beautiful such that I could look at something and without even consulting you, I presuppose or assume that given the same opportunity to share this phenomenon with me in our experience, we would agree, right? So whatever differences separate us in the course of our everyday empirical lives, this is some, um, in, in, in an importantly describable sense, objective phenomenon because it's before us that we can all appreciate that brings us together, right? That um, somehow stands up against those divisive um, orientations of our separate existences, our separate realities, you might even say. Um, and it's strange because we're not strictly speaking dealing with an objective characteristic or property. Um, such as we find in cognitive judgments, whereby we can all agree logically that the object sitting outside of my window is a tree. So if you were supplied the, as Kant puts it, sensory intuition of whatever it is supposedly out there in the external world that transmits itself as a kind of optical species for your visual enjoyment, if you have that, we all have it, and we have recourse to the concept tree, then we can all come to unquestionable logical agreement that what we're dealing with is a tree. But when it comes to even a flower or the very same tree that I'm coming to make sense of descriptively, say um, maybe even scientifically, uh, there is no property that I can pinpoint and separate from other properties and say, okay, there's the beauty in the tree. You see it? You see it just like you see the leaf, just like you see the flower. Um, that would be like if, if I bring you as a, as a potential student to SOU to give you a tour of the campus and I bring you to say Churchill Hall or I would never do this to you, Central Hall. That's where I am now. It's a pretty shitty building. But if I were to bring you to one of these buildings and say, okay, here we are. And you might say, no, I wanna see the university. <laughs> Take me to the university. That's where I wanna go. Um, there would be a, a kind of com confusion of conceptual categories here. Um, just like if I were to say, all right, you see the tree, you see the leaf, you see the bark, you see the branch. Now, do you see the beauty? It's not some determinate property that I can pinpoint and distinguish from others. So there's nothing then objective that we can turn to as a collective to find ourselves in agreement. Yet we presuppose, I sort of assume that because I'm experiencing the tree as beautiful, because there's nothing ultimately profoundly different about your subjective capacities from mine that we would have to agree about it. Um, yeah, so good. And, I just want to return though to Eva, the first thing you were saying. So with these weird quarantine or lockdown conditions, I think this is the sense that I, I took away from your first comment is that we're able to, we perhaps notice things that we might have been oblivious to. And we notice some, some things maybe in our domestic spheres or everyday lives that we typically ignore because they're just not all that interesting. Um, given other things that we take to be interesting that we notice is maybe beautiful. But do you have any examples of that? Or does anyone else have an example of something that uh, because of social distancing or everything socially, culturally, even kind of slowing down or shutting down that you might have noticed that um, otherwise escaped your attention? I don't think I have like a specific example, but what comes to mind is definitely maybe the beauty in like, 
um, simplicity and like structure and just kind of like not it, the structure that we kind of have to face in our daily lives these days where like you know zoom classes and kind of stuff like that or I should say like the lack of structure where you know we don't have this block of time that we're at this specific location we're just kind of left to meander our like small little spaces on our own yeah good so there seems to be then in what you just said an element or dimension of freedom that opens up um, and freedom to, you might say, be distracted from what ordinarily occupies us or compels us and our focus and attention. Um, so for example, you might not notice the beauty of foliage and trees and flowers or of a particularly striking sunset if you're really consumed by your everyday activities, which are driven by the demands that are placed on you as maybe a student or a worker or a father or a mother or a sibling or something like that. Um, being freed up from the rigidity of these habitual routines and demands, you might be opened then in a kind of freedom to that which is typically um, outside of your purview or understanding or even consideration. Uh, and so I think that's, that's really cool. And so if you also think about how those roles that I mentioned that can restrict us and um, close us off from the more uh, freely self-showing beautiful aspects of our world, uh, those might issue from um, a kind of subjective source that yields in our experience what Kant labels the agreeable or the pleasant. So for example, I have these kind of carnal biological drives, which I'm assuming all of you do too, such that I need to eat, <laughs> I need to drink, I need to sleep. And if I get a particularly rewarding sandwich, I'll say, oh, this is a great sandwich. This is really pleasant, right? So I derive pleasure from it. And that's not the same thing as beautiful because the sandwich, in addition to whatever enjoyment I might get it, get from it, is serving a particular purpose, right? Um, yet, when I'm able to see that the tree outside my window is beautiful, the pleasure I get is not the kind of hedonistic, let's say utilitarian pleasure that I derive from um, resolving a tension such as feeling hunger, right? So a sandwich, even if it's not very good, even if it's a relatively shitty sandwich, it'll still give me some pleasure if I'm hungry before I eat it. So in that sense, it's a pleasure, but it's not a free pleasure because it's, um, it's arising in my experience as in any case, something I enjoy because of a biological necessity. Uh, whereas there's something freeing about the possibility of experiencing uh, beauty. So a lot of these demands that have been altered or um, rendered in a new light or suspended or, or something like that, given these lockdown conditions, they can also serve in a surprising way to free us up um, to a new orientation to, to beauty. Um, and so I think that's something that we can pull out of Kant. So uh, yeah, thanks for, for sharing that, Eva. Um, so room, um, rooms three and four are pretty small. So I'll just put those together. So that was uh, Brianna, Destry, Owen, Kai, and Michaela. Did you guys come up with anything we haven't talked about so far that you'd like to share? As far as uh, the third room goes, we were actually talking about just what was just being talk talked about how um the quarantine has affected our perception of beauty at least i thought that was where we really hit home because um brianna actually shared uh, her experiences from quarantine and i thought that they well they just seemed really interesting because and, and you can do more justice to your experience than i can but overall it seems like as normalcy is stripped away the beauty 
in the world in general is is not dulled but actually is it can become more obvious in places as was just discussed we're always there mm -hmm. and the way i think about it is is like um there is a comparison between flowers and pebbles earlier but in a world without flowers or even in a world that used to have flowers but no longer does i wonder how many people would begin to just fawn over over the the best pebbles that they could find yeah so in the absence in of my, flowers, yeah pebbles might be in my experience um i just i figured this is something that you know really well too but i mentioned the quarantine when i went to basic training and how like on top of them already dehumanizing us and taking away everything and screaming at us, we were also locked like in a sleep bay and we couldn't go anywhere or do anything. And literally the highlight of the day was going outside and eating MREs. Like everybody got excited to just like read the packages on the MREs or like look at the little uh, uh, specks of grass that were growing in the cracks of the sidewalks. But I was thinking it relates to his theory because enjoying that kind of thing uh, eventually becomes like a freedom because it can be taken away so easily from you. Yeah, that's interesting. <laughs> yeah, that's really cool. A lot of what you just said is cool. So, um, in so that's, I mean, coming from a place like basic training, which is in many respects, uh, a microcosm of the broader society from which from which each individual is pulled. Um, so thinking about my own experience in the military, I made friends with people that I otherwise under um, ordinary conditions never would have met or been friends with. They're so different from me, but there's something about that experience that makes you uh, as unpleasant as it sometimes can be, focus on the similarities as points of attraction or interest in your lives rather than the differences. So um, you might enjoy like country music versus someone who likes industrial noise or hip hop or, <laughs> or whatever else, but you find yourselves in that weird moment eating like shitty ham steak MREs and musing collectively over the beauty of a blade of grass. <laughs> that's penetrating some conc or, or penetrating through some like concrete or something. Um, and that's nothing that any of you as individuals would have thought to share as a description in more abstract circumstances of what you usually find pleasant or beautiful or agreeable or whatever else. Now you find yourself all saying, oh yeah, that's very interesting together. And so I think that's a really helpful example to make sense of how art and the experience of the beautiful and the sort of reflective judgment by which we come to recognize the beautiful can bring us together and can even bring us together across uh, rigid cultural boundaries <laughs> uh, and rigid historical boundaries too. Uh, because of course, what is attractive or appealing or interesting to us in the 21st century um, was obviously in many ways quite different in say the 18th century from, from where Kant is writing. But nevertheless, we can all see a beautiful display of form according to Kant and recognize collectively, even if subjectively, but importantly intersubjectively, that these things are beautiful uh, through that kind of judgment. Okay, cool. Um, I'm checking the chat. Kai wrote, many strive to create more and push past what was considered the height of beauty. Perhaps the search for true beauty is what gives art real meaning. It's not about the destination or final conclusion. It's about the journey and the discoveries we make along the way. After all, I believe beauty is something we can only discover for ourselves. Yeah, so that last point's interesting. So the judgment, the reflective judgment of something being beautiful comes from the individual subject. So in our experience and something that we come upon individually, but when we make that judgment, we're opening up a shared space of universal perception, let's say, even if in every instance, the source 
of that perception, perception is subjective. Um, and that's why for Kant, although I can assume that you find this dogwood tree or would find this dogwood tree outside my window beautiful, uh, it could be as a matter of fact that you don't. In which case though, I would have legitimate grounds to question you <laughs> and you know, ask you, well, look at it some more. Whereas if we're, we're dealing with something merely subjective in a, um, a purely uh, pleasant sense, like food or drink or something like that, we're all happy, as we say, to agree to disagree. But when it comes to the beautiful, we, although we can disagree, so that's important not to forget for Kant, we can disagree, but we're not content to just let ourselves disagree. That's why we have art criticism, right? That's why uh, we have robust and sometimes really heated debates and conversations over these things that you would never encounter over people arguing about, um, well, maybe you would, <laughs> but about like what's, what's better, Puck's Donuts or, uh, or some other shitty donut. Uh, <laughs> um, all right, so um, any other comments or questions about this before we take a quick break? Um, I'd actually like to comment on something. Yeah, sure. I forgot to write this up in my uh, follow-up for it, but I also believe that just because something does not fit our what our view of beauty is, that doesn't mean we should think because of that alone we should think any less of it. Like I think a real, I think one of the best things you can have is like multiple different perspectives on many different kinds of beauty, not just one definition. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah, exactly. I mean, we can we can disagree about what is what counts as beautiful as an example of beauty, um, but I mean, isn't that importantly different though from how we come to disagree about things over which we have no control in terms of of advancing or rendering more sophisticated, say, our taste in things. So um, just the experience of something simple in the way of food or drink. Uh, so are you, I mean, I'm trying to understand what you're saying there. Is that importantly different from just to use these examples, the beauty of a sunset or the beauty of a flower or something like that? Um, because, I mean, I'm just a little confused about what you said because, uh, I mean, what do you mean by kinds of, or forms of beauty? Can you maybe say a little more about that? Um, well, I mean, it, it's tough to, it's tough to say, like, I, I still don't really have, I still don't really have a full understanding of, of that, but, you know, like, People, people have their own views. And I feel like those are the different kinds of, they're you know, just different kinds, like maybe like a different art style or something like that. Mm -hmm. that that's, that's, yeah, that's what I mean here. Okay. Yeah, but so, I mean, Kant's position gives us the opportunity to agree with you on the one hand, that people as a matter of fact, in the ordinary course of experience can come to differing views on what counts as beautiful. But on the other hand, having recognized that truth to his theory, the question remains open in such a way that, and this is where the social ethical aspect comes in, that we're not content to just leave it. We wanna talk about it more. We wanna explore it more. So if you say something is beautiful and I just can't see it, um, there's something about me being human and you being human that would push me to really want to grasp your point of view. Yeah, to understand it better instead of yeah, just immediately so can, discredit it. Exactly, so instead of saying, oh, well, you're stupid, that's not beautiful. <laughs> I might think, well, how, how are you seeing that as beautiful? Like, I really wanna know. And in pursuing that question, I am sort of elevating and bringing to yeah. the fore what makes me human and what makes you human. So yeah. even though we're disagreeing, we're kind of sharing something together. Yeah. It's That's much really more productive to give things a chance before you immediately start hating. Right. <laughs> okay, good, good. Okay, so um, 
Yeah, why don't we take just a quick break and then we'll come back and uh, James and Destery will uh, lead us on a discussion. So for our presenters for today. So um, yeah, let's take just five minutes or so and then we'll come back. And um, okay, good. So I'll see you guys in a few minutes. I'll pause the recording. <clears throat> Just noticing uh, what Owen said in the chat a little while ago. <laughs> yeah, so one subtitle for this course I, I considered um, using was from cave paintings to memes and everything in between. <laughs> uh, so I really like that you mentioned uh, the absurd humor that one can experience in the face of, of ridiculous memes, because that is certainly a kind of aesthetic phenomenon, an aesthetic experience, um, uh, but not one that, that Kant would consider uh, beautiful but that's just because there are many different kinds of experiences in the way of aesthetic judgment that one can arrive at when it comes to such things and not simply the beautiful, although that's really what we're spending all of our time talking about. Um, so, uh, but he does mention the sublime and he does, he does mention the ugly, of course. And curiously, uh, and I might ask about this later, um, if any of you picked up on this, he talks about the mode um, the subjective experiential kind of sensuous mode of disgust. <laughs> um, so that's when it comes to even events or objects which we take to be unpleasant um, or in other words, ugly, that in the face of which we feel disgust, Kant suggests, is the one limit to transforming ugliness to, to beauty. <laughs> Uh, but uh, I, I think there are many um, modern and contemporary artists that have done their best to challenge that conclusion on the part of, of Kant. Um, but that's just kind of something interesting to mention. But okay, so uh, James and Destry are with us as this week's presenters. So um, are you, you guys, you're going to use some kind of document? So should I give you my, or should I share my host status with one of you? Oh uh, yeah, that, uh, yeah, that should be good. All right. Oh, yeah, that should be good. All right, I'll share it with James. Okay, so now you should be able to share your screen with us. Okay, I will open the, uh... so, um... So uh, Destry is going to is going to read uh, the first part that's going to be uh, that mostly covers the readings that were done on Tuesday, and then I'm going to uh, summarize the uh, I'm going to summarize the set the uh, the readings that were that are for today. Okay. Okay. So uh, yeah. Uh, can you see the screen? Yep. Yeah. Okay. That's uh, good. Okay. So, uh, Destry, do you want to start? Yeah, so pretty much there are dis uh, about four distinct features to what Kant talks about in terms of aesthetic judgment, and that is based on feeling. And so the first part of it is going to be disinterested. So we are judging something to be beautiful, uh, or we're, we're getting pleasure from viewing it because we judge it to be beautiful rather than judging something to be beautiful because we're getting pleasure from it. So with something like, say, drinking alcohol, uh, you might find something like that beautiful, but because you're getting pleasure from it. Uh, whereas if you were to be, say, looking at a painting, you're not really necessarily getting something from it inherently. And so you're getting satisfaction because you're viewing it as something that's beautiful. Um, 
And also I thought that it was interesting to think about how judgment of beauty is based on feelings rather than objective sensation. Uh, and that distinguishes them from cognitive judgments based on perception, something like this thing is green rather than like green elicits this feeling in me. And then, um, and it's also different than something that's just agreeable. Uh, so like food or drink and also judgments of good. So whether it's morally good or bad. And then if you scroll down a little, um, Kant also claims that the aesthetic judgment must concern itself only with form. And this is something that we talked about in last class um, and or in the object that's presented. So it's not sensible content since the latter has a deep connection to the agreeable and thus to interest. And then the second and third parts are that it's universal and necessary. So we basically expect everyone else to agree with us about our aesthetic judgments um, as though it were a tangible object. And then we argue about it as if it were a tangible object, um, thinking that maybe we could you know, get someone to change their mind as to whether they think this painting is beautiful. Um, and that because of this, desp despite their universal validity, we don't really have an objective thing that you can necessarily say that is what makes this object beautiful. And I think we talked about that a little earlier in this class. Uh, and Kant calls this common sense, since you can't just look at a tree and be like, this is the singular thing about the tree that makes it beautiful. And then the final thing is it's um, purposive without purpose. So pretty much the way I understood this is that artistic beauty doesn't really have a purpose in in like to to be something other than itself and that, that is what makes it able to be beautiful um and i saw that that was connected to the fact that artistic beauty derives from natural beauty and how we're, we're supposed to have successful artwork be genuine and look like nature or reference nature without being exactly like it but also not being too artificial um, and so unlike judgments of the good, judgments of the beautiful do not uh, presuppose an end or purpose, which the object is taken to satisfy. So like when you make a painting, it's not meant to quench your thirst. It's not meant to, you know, be used as a piece of clothing. It doesn't have an objective purpose other than to simply be art. And because it is simply being art, that is its purpose. And I thought that that was especially related to how nature allows for the beauty of art um, and how if we didn't have nature, we wouldn't really be able to create art because artistic beauty is distinctly separate from nature, yet it should still seem as it was derived naturally from it. Uh, and so it's that fine line where it's like, you have to be able to recognize something as artistically beautiful and that it is not, not like nature's beauty but we still don't have to assign a cognitive label to the artwork. We don't have to understand it to still appreciate it um, because nature sets out these universal rules where we aren't giving it this one objective thing that we find beautiful, but rather giving, giving art the ability to be almost, I wanna say ambiguous, like, the fact that it can lie on this very thin line between being like nature, but still being its own, that you have to use some form of originality to still get the essence of nature without copying it exactly. I found that to be very interesting and in how like the rules of artistic beauty are set up that way. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, that's really great. <clears throat> Now I will go for my summary of uh, the second part of the reading, broken down, broken down by the sort of broke. I, I broke, I broke this down by the various sub chapters that Kant gives. So the first part is on taste, which he poses the idea of census communists for understanding taste. The idea that in order for judgment of taste, there must be an existing consensus of what taste is. Then he talks about what a genius is. So he says he views genius as a talent, which is a product of nature. 
Uh, however, the fact that it's a product of nature means that it can't really describe how it, how it, it's, it's, that there's a certain irrational element to it and that like, there's no, you, you can't describe how it's been brought around. For example, like uh, a genius, a genius for an, a personal, a personal example, I will cite uh, Kanye West, um, like he doesn't know how his idea, he doesn't know, I mean, he, he, he doesn't, he probably doesn't know how his ideas come to him often. He also, he also, he also puts the emphasis on genius as a creative force rather than just rather than just how we learn. So, for example, in modern day in, in, in modern day society, when we talk about geniuses, we often talk about, you know, a kid genius is someone who can learn their times tables very quickly. This is not this is not a genius in Kant's definition. Kant, Kant's definition of a genius is how someone can how someone can create can create new stuff, which is and and ties artistry to it a lot. He then says that he says that genius, genius and taste both tie into the concept, to the idea of beautiful art, and that genius is needed to create it, while taste is needed to while taste is needed to judge it. He also distinguishes between beautiful art, which is an original creation, and uh, and uh, and uh, art and art which and art which imit and art which imitates art which imitates each other, also as artificial. Uh, I can't remember what it was actually. And then he so uh, he then uh, oh 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 it's artificial art people artificial beauty so he has so he has so he has so he has says so beautiful art which is a creation and then beautiful art which is an imitation of another which he which he refers to as artificial beauty and he deems inferior and is not particularly doesn't doesn't seem to like that too much he says but he says in he but then he but then he says in order to separate the two. We need to. Uh, this is where the this is where the this is where purpose comes in because you need to know the purpose of the art and how and, and why it was created in order to separate in order to separate art which is beautiful and was original and art which is beautiful that is imitative. So, so whether an art piece is good isn't just dependent on whether it looks good. So there's he he believes in art. He believes there's an extra dimension to what makes good art. The next, the last parts is then he goes on about what is, uh, he talks about what are the parts of a genius mind in which he contemplates the notion of spirit, which he says is not necessary for beautiful art, but, but is still, but still praises it as it, as it's an, as it's helpful in animating the creative, as it's helpful in animating the creative process, although it is not necessary for art, beautiful art to exist. Also views genius in a, a artistic light rather than a rational one. And uh, and it is a talent for art, not for science. And it must produce something that it is that is original for it to be considered genius. And uh, and then he also says that he also says that the originality is important. That he says that while originality is important in the creation of beautiful art, he also says that it must relate to it. Also must relate to the laws of understanding. Therefore, no matter how amazing it might be to you. A, a genius can't just create some incoherent piece. It has to be understood by the viewer. So in that sense, and in that sense, taste is a uh, taste complements genius by ensuring that genius creates stuff that is by ensuring that genius creates stuff that can be understood. So hence, taste almost acts as a training and a condition for genius. And finally, is this is just a summary of Kant, of Kant divides the arts into the art of words. So that's rhetoric and poetry, formative art, which is paintings, architecture and gardening and art of what he describes as sensible intuition. And then finally, there's the art of play of sensations, which is music. And to some extent, there's an overlap between this and formative art because a painting through its colors and evocative emotions can also be a play of sensations. And uh, that, is our, that is our presentation. Good, good. Um... Excellent. Yeah, you guys did a really great job of unpacking and walking us through these incredibly uh, torturous <laughs> distinctions and arguments. Um, so really nice job. Um, it didn't. It didn't. It didn't help that some of his. It didn't help that the way he lays out some of his arguments don't tend to follow a single cohesive narrative, cohesive narrative or pattern of thought. For example, the stuff where he go. For example, when he goes on about uh, when he starts. When he starts talking about sort of like spirit, he, he it's it, it, it it almost feels more like a tangent than it does tying into an argument. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I'm glad you picked up on that um, with respect to spirit in particular. Uh, so now we're in a place to anticipate some of the direction that we'll witness next week as we move to Hegel, because um, spirit or in the German Geist is going to be centrally important for Hegel's reflections on art. Um, and he's influenced in that way to some extent by Kant, uh, but in a way that uh, Hegel wants to give more systematic uh, treatment to the role of, of spirit. Where, as you noted, um, James and Kant, it's just sort of um, uh, suggestive and, and maybe tendential or something uh, without any clear role. It's even unclear exactly in terms of the definitions that he attempts to give to spirit, what he means uh, precisely. So it's still a little confusing. Um, so yeah, it's good that you noticed that because we're gonna see how Hegel handles the concept um, next week. Um, okay, so also based on the last part um, of the reading and of your presentation of it, I wonder what you guys think about the idea that gardening is, from Kant's perspective, a species of painting. <laughs> so for Kant, and this is maybe surprising to our uh, 21st century ears, but for Kant, gardening was one of the most important varieties of art and a source of aesthetic experience. Um, not gardening as a physical practice that you would engage in, but the end result. So uh, think about when you walk through a beautiful garden that's been curated with this or that uh, varietal. Um, so what do you guys think about that, that gardening is a kind of painting? <laughs> I mean, at first, it kind of seems like not necessarily, especially when he puts so much emphasis on artistic beauty being different than like naturalistic beauty, and that like, it has to be like it, but not exactly the same. And I think at one point, he tries to say that like, a rose is like naturally beautiful, but not artistically beautiful. But when I think about it, like, yes, a garden does have its own purpose when you plant like vegetables or fruit or even just pretty flowers, like there is a purpose for that. You're supposed to derive pleasure and satisfaction from consuming food or, you know, getting herbs or whatever. But I feel like if it weren't arranged specifically, then that argument would hold. But the fact that there is human intervention and that people are putting in something original with the design of the garden or with like irrigation systems um, or how easy it is to access the food or, or whatever it is that you're gardening. I could see how that could be argued to be artistic beauty because it does still mimic natural beauty because well, it is natural beauty, but there is still that element of human, human connection or I guess human interaction with the material that gives it that originality component that I think constitutes as artistic beauty to Kant. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we have to keep in mind though that when he talks about garden, he doesn't mean a garden that's put together for the sourcing of foodstuffs, right? So he has in mind in particular, uh, and this was very much in vogue at the time in the 18th century, um, like English gardens um, or French gardens. And of the two, uh, Kant favored the English garden, um, somewhat surprisingly. But it might be helpful just to pull up a couple of images of these. Uh, what's a good example? This is a pretty good example. This will help to make sense of an important part of Kant's argument too. And one that you guys as presenters have been focusing on to some extent. Okay, so first here's an example of an English garden. So notice it's made up of various charming or attractive um, forms and colors. So forms emerging out of patterns of, of growth 
and intermingling of these different species within the space, and then colors, which are given particular locations relative to each other uh, to um, create a beautiful aesthetic experience, which in this case, like painting, right, as one example of the formative arts is visual, right? So any sort of aesthetic pleasure in particular that is yielding an aesthetic judgment of beauty would not be made available to you if you were to walk around this garden and touch things. So tactility is, is not a source of, of beauty. And um, Hegel will actually pick up on that argument a little bit next week that we'll see. Uh, that when it comes to our sense modalities, the sense of, of the haptic sense, so the sense of touch or of tactility does not participate in, as Hegel puts it, the wellsprings of art's beauty. Um, so if you judge this garden to be beautiful, it's only because of the visual play of the forms and colors with each other, which make up a kind of rhythm that's analogous to the sort of temporal rhythm that you experience in listening to music, for example, um, and harmony and melody, uh, melody more so than, than harmony playing with time. Um, and so, uh, <clears throat> like Destery said, a rose, so if you look at a single rose or any other individual flower, that would be an example of what call, Kant calls natural beauty, because it's not a work of human art. Um, but this garden, and this English garden is um, an example of that. And I'll pull it up here, sorry. Oops, oh, that's why. You haven't been seeing what I'm seeing. I needed to reclaim my host status, sorry. Uh, okay, so here's the English garden that I've been talking about. Um, so if you were to walk through this garden and experience it as beautiful, that's because of the interaction that is the formal or rhythmic play between objects which are in their originary composition, um, natural, of natural design. So outside of, of any sort of human intervention or change. Um, so this is an example of the English garden. And then just real quick, I wanna show um, a French garden by contrast. And so I'll ask you after looking at this example of a French garden, um, so this is Versailles, uh, why Kant would think that the, in terms of beauty, the English garden is better. So here's an example of an English garden, which you can still visit today, but it's a kind of artistic practice and design that emerged um, from around the uh, 18th century, the late 17th century. So just in terms of comparing those forms, so having looked at the English garden and now looking at this French garden, what strikes you as significantly different between the two? Well, that French garden is obviously very manicured. There's a lot of uh, thought and design that was put into that. Uh, you know, the possibilities are endless as far as what they could do with it. Whereas an English garden, like you said, it kind of celebrates the beauty and what is natural. And I know that uh, um, from what I'm understanding with Kant, that that's a big part of uh, his definition of it, of uh, you know, being something that's, uh, that's natural. It's something that everybody can look at and say, oh, that's, that's beautiful for whatever reason. Um, I've got kind of some ideas behind that that I haven't been able to iron out in my head yet. Um, but the gist of it is that anything that's completely natural um, it has seasons, it goes through change, it goes through loss, just like we do, and so we can kind of relate to it a little bit better. Maybe that that's kind of, uh, you know, the, the purpose of it, in you know, whoever created this simulation that we're all in, is to give us something to look at and say, oh, well, that's still beautiful. Um, maybe I can keep moving forward. Does that make sense? Probably yeah, not. that makes sense. Cool. Um, good, good. So you've got, I think you're getting at a lot of what's at play here in constant theory, but um, yeah, Owen, go ahead. The English garden is like an oil painting, but the French garden is like an acrylic painting. How so? Could you elaborate? So 
Just take note of how many different plants there are in the English garden and the way in which they're being grown. When you, now I'm not a painter, but I know painters and um, it's my understanding that oil paintings are hardly ever like really seen as being completely dry. And so while you paint with oil, you're sort of always having to think about how each stroke will play into the future strokes and at and, and the painting at large. But with acrylic, and maybe acrylic isn't even the best example, that French garden is more like a Sharpie drawing um, of just grass and some potted trees. Um, there, It's rigid and it's plain and that's not a bad thing, but it's it's almost like two dimensional, whereas the English garden is three dimensional. Right, good, so remember, we're referring and, and we're referring to an understanding Kant's aesthetic theory as foundationally the formalist theory of art, such that the source of beauty in artistic experience and production is um, the, in some measure, cognizable form, although the cognition, the knowledge productive aspect isn't what's important, uh, but it's given to a cognizing subject for the free play of the understanding and the imagination. And it's really the form that's doing the work of putting those aspects of the cognitive subject's consciousness into a free play. And so, there's form in, involved in both. So I hope you can see as I move from the English garden you know, here to the, the, the French garden. Um, so there's form in both, but the form is much more obvious as you pointed out when it comes to the French garden. And so this is much more obviously a work of if we call it beautiful, if we want to arrive at that judgment, a work of artificial beauty, right? Um, this could not have happened in nature, <laughs> uh, this sort of thing. It looks like in many ways, a kind of alien environment, right? Um, but look again at the English garden. This is clearly curated. It's not a natural space. It's not just something that one stumbled upon in a forest. This has been designed. Each of these plants has been brought in here. So this too, no less really than the French garden is a work of artificial beauty. Um, yet, and this goes to the point that both Destry and James were uh, bringing to our attention and, and, and unpacking for us, um, this garden, the English garden looks much more like it could have been spontaneously brought forth by the powers of nature. <laughs> Right? So as a work of art, so Kant would consider this, this English garden, a work of art, which is uh, strangely, but it should make sense now why he says this, a variety or species of painting. Um, but it is a kind of formative art or work of formative art that simultaneously looks as if it could have come from nature, but it's also recognizable for us as not having come from nature. <laughs> so that's, as Destry put it in his presentation, this kind of fine line that Kant wants us to walk. Um, and that the genius in particular is capable of bringing about in manifest sensuous forms that display for us and give us the opportunity to work through in an open-ended way what he calls aesthetical ideas. Um, whereas if there's too much artificiality on the part of the manipulative work done by the artist, this can kind of stifle, as James was putting it, the importantly irrational element that's at play that seems to serve no real purpose. Uh, and so there's this danger when it comes to producing works of art that one could err too much on the side of manipulation and therefore contrivance Right, so a work of art might seem too contrived, too obviously made, <laughs> too obviously created. Um, that is to say, in those instances, the artist was too strictly appealing to already entrenched principles, formulae, or ideas about what's necessary to produce a good work of art. 
Um, so one has to follow such rules to some extent because the artwork has to be intelligible for the viewer, for the consumer. You have to be able to recognize it at once as a work of art, but paradoxically almost not too much like a work of art, <laughs> if that makes any sense. Um, so does this, does this make sense, these examples, amusing of the garden? So another, we could also talk about interior design for Kant as an example of painting or a species of painting, uh, where you're not exactly talking about furniture like desks and couches and chairs, dressers and so forth, uh, because these are more strictly speaking architectural because they are at the same time aesthetic given that we expect them to give us some pleasure or beauty, but they're also utilitarian. They serve some particular functional role. So however attractive a chair might be in your living room, if you can't sit on it, <laughs> then it's not really a chair. It's not really a piece of furniture. But think about how we use ornament and decoration in our house. Um, so you might have a vase of flowers on a table, and then a painting on a wall, a statue in the corner. These aren't architectural in that they serve some functional purpose, but they're like these flowers that you would encounter in a garden. There's the free um, interaction of the form that emerges from the relationship between the parts that facilitates the experience of beauty, right? So you can look at a whole room and how colors and shapes and so forth are laid out and designed and given a particular um, array and say the whole space is beautiful. Whereas I might uh, think that the red color that's coming from the corner of the room, if I just focus on that red color, I might understand it to be charming or appealing, but it's not yet beautiful. The beauty arises in my judgment when I'm putting the sensuous appearance in itself charming of that color of red with other formal uh, dimensions which show up empirically in my experience. Okay, uh, so I'm going to um, go back to the slides just to focus on a couple of things. Um, so a lot of this we've already talked about. Um, so this one we've talked about, I think. But I wanna jump ahead a little bit. <laughs> so I encourage you to, to walk through these slides and to you know, send me an email if you have any questions about them. But here's an example. Um, so this is a painting from I think 1921 by Kandinsky uh, or the 1920s at least. Um, oops. So, oh, 1925, uh, yellow, red, blue is the name of it. So, you know, we don't have too much time left for today, but one question I want to spend a little bit of our energy on and focus on is um, to compare the mimetic theory of art that we've talked about last week and the week before to Kant's formalist theory of art. So um, if Aristotle is right, that all art is essentially mimetic, in other words, imitative, we can ask what this theoretical orientation ends up doing to something like um, non-figurative or non-representational art, uh, which, came about really in the 20th century, um, but there are important uh, presages to that in the, the 19th century. So um, look at this painting by Kandinsky. <laughs> so using the imitative theory of art, art as mimesis, we might ask, well, what exactly was Kandinsky imitating here? <laughs> so in terms of a figural object or a representation, what are we looking at? in this painting? Like what is being represented? What is being imitated? Uh, I thought that uh, like it's the imitation of whatever he's perceiving in his mind. Um, 
I thought that that's kind of what the whole imitation of imitation meant, right? Right. Um, so for Aristotle, all poiesis or bringing forth that is facilitated by techne begins with a kind of mental image, right? Which is then expressed when we're talking about painting imagistically, pictor pictorially. Um, but here's a problem with mimesis. Is it necessarily the case that Kandinsky, before he created this painting, yellow, red, blue, that he had uh, a more or less perfect uh, model of which this final result, this painting would be a copy? <laughs> so did Kandinsky have this image in his head, which pretty much looks like this, and then he's imitating it uh, or not? Well, that would be really, I don't know, that would be curious and, and quite incredible <laughs> to me, right? Um, he was probably, I would say, and this is true of a lot of non-representational, non-figural art, he would probably be a little bit surprised, Kandinsky, in certain directions that he took in creating this painting over a period of time. Um, and also in terms of what's presented or represented, what's depicted, well, there doesn't, I mean, you can pull out little aspects of the piece, which you might in your experience associate with certain forms or objects. Um, so maybe you say this little thing here looks like a Rubik's cube or something. <laughs> but clearly Kandinsky is not representing a Rubik's cube here. Um, so the pleasure that we experience if we identify this painting as beautiful, isn't reducible to, or it's not intelligible in the terms of the artist having accurately represented some natural um, phenomenon. So Aristotle says it's in mimesis that we as viewers or listeners of poetry or, or whatever, experience pleasure in the face of a successful imitation, um, whether we're imitating sensuous forms or if we're imitating objects or if we're imitating character types and kinds of action, which might be ethical or unethical. In this case, in this painting, in terms of what's figured, there doesn't seem to be anything that is accurately or inaccurately imitated. <laughs> um, so then there's something deficient when it comes to mimetic theory for making sense of certain forms of art, like this one. Uh, but what would Kant say about this? So if we recognize Kandinsky's work here as beautiful, on the basis of what are we coming to that determination? So where, you might say, is the beauty in this painting? So what are we recognizing as beautiful in virtue of what aspect or what series of relationships or however you might want to put it? I, I'd be curious to know uh, what painting similar to that came out before this guy produced that. Because uh, I mean, if this is kind of a new style of painting, you know, where he's got, you know, straight lines mixed with, you know, blend bleeding colors and squiggly lines and stuff. I mean, it, this looks like something that a computer made in 1995, not 1925. <laughs> uh, maybe people saw it, and it's uh, it's just such a radical new concept of how to do, you know, whatever it is that he did, that that's what made them classify this as beautiful. They couldn't really define define it and say like, okay, well, I have a rational explanation where there's a you know some natural tone to this. Um, it's just something else that uh, maybe brings forth the possibility of of just creation in itself. Um, does that make sense? Yeah, so someone from a mimetic orientation might say, well, the artist is imitating precisely the unbounded powers of nature, <laughs> right? So as nature can generate sometimes surprising forms, that's what the artist is doing here. Forms which don't determinately settle into this or that recognizable object. Um, but Kant would say, remember, so we're talking about formalism here. Um, an individual color cannot be beautiful. It can merely be charming. And this is what Kant chalks up to, as he puts it, barbaric taste. <laughs> so you have a sort of barbaric or barbarian taste if you're too strongly attracted to uh, the various um, colors of an object. 
um, an aesthetic object that's supposed to be a painting or a piece of sculpture or whatever else. Just like in music, if you find yourself really appealing in your experience of pleasure to say uh, the sound of the violin, that is the particular sensuous um, noise of the violin or of the cello or of a clarinet, well, those sounds can only be charming. The beauty of a musical form comes about through the composition, that is through the relationship of the individual sounds. Just like for Kant in the case of paintings, um, as an example of formative art, it's the relationship, the structural relationship between the colors, not the individual colors themselves, which can be pronounced as the source of beauty. Um, does that make sense? Um, and so I just want to show you another painting real quick. And pull it up here. So this is by uh, Piet Mondrian. So some of you might be familiar with Mondrian. So this is another example of, um, of non-figural art, that is to say non-representational, given that there's no specific object which is copied or given here in a new expressive mode. Um, and so what you find is a pattern or a form, that is, that's made up of the relationship between the various parts, each of which play a role in the constitution of the whole. So um, for Kant, interpreting the judgment of beauty that one might make about this Mondrian painting, he would say, if you, if you look at this painting and say, this is really beautiful, um, it's not because you like yellow. <laughs> it's not because you like blue or red. It's not because you like squares. It's because of the character of your experience that gave rise to the judgment and because of the judgment, you're able to say it's a peculiar kind of pleasure, um, a uniquely aesthetic pleasure. That arises here because of the interplay of the parts. Um, the way in which the various parts relate to each other as a kind of form. And so here's where formalism develops in the 20th century. Even if we were to take an obviously representational work of art or figural work of art where say a horse is depicted or something. If you find that horse in its representation beautiful, it's not because you like horses. It's not because the thing is a horse. It's because of the pleasure that is given to your experience on the basis of what you perceive in the relationship of the images or the aspects of the images um, that show up, even if you're able to recognize it as a depiction of a horse, for example, right? Uh, so does that make sense? And so this might seem really restrictive on the one hand, because you can't say, oh, colors aren't beautiful. And if you look at a nude, for example, of a beautiful woman, and you say, oh, wow, she's really hot <laughs> or really attractive or something like that, Kant would say, well, you're not relating to the painting in such a manner that would appropriately give rise to the experience of beauty because you are interested in the object. <laughs> you have a kind of prurient or sexual interest in it. But you might still look at the, the nude of a woman and just recognize the beauty of the pattern, of the form, um, independently of what is given in that form, namely the physical presence of a body and identify it as beautiful. And so that's where the disinterest comes in. It's a sort of disinterested interest, but okay. So we've gone over time here. I apologize about that. Um, but just a reminder, you've got your first reflection paper due this week on Sunday, in addition to the discussion forum. And then next week we'll turn to Hegel. Um, and um, uh, after that, we've got our midterm paper, right? So we'll take a bit of a break from introducing and working through new material. So um, 
yeah, I hope you have a good weekend and I look forward to reading your papers. Let me turn them in and I'll see you guys on Tuesday. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. All right, see ya.